This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com. Hi, my name is Eero Kafetz, and this is The Liz Building Lifestyle, the only podcast which delivers cutting-edge conversion strategies from the online trenches straight to your earbuds. Download the transcript of today's episode and all future episodes at lizbuildinglifestyleshow.com. I also invite you to grab a free copy of the Wealthy Liz Builder Survival Guide at lizbuildinglifestyleshow.com forward slash survival. And now, once again, it's time to claim your Liz Building Lifestyle. Welcome back, list builders, to another edition of the list building lifestyle with Mr. Igor K. Fetz in a coffee shop. Oh, is that is that where I was supposed to say something like, "Oh, hey"? <laughs> so, wait a second. You're living the list building lifestyle again. Usually, you're in a quiet place. The last few episodes, I, I swear, I've heard kids screaming and stuff. Are you waterboarding people out there that are scamming? our marketers or what the hell's going on dude you won't believe um i'm in a coffee shop and i have nowhere else to go <laughs> I, it's just, I'm a it's just as simple as that you know <laughs> yeah i'm just i'm just like that i just i just have no nowhere else to go a buddy of mine where you know i used to record these episodes or in his pla- over at his place in his like little office space and you know he won't let me do it anymore because he needs it and um i feel kind of bad fighting him for it you know uh, back home when we record which is usually the time when erica comes back home from uh, from uh, kindergarten it's impossible to record because she's running around and screaming and you know my wife is screaming and everybody's screaming that's that's how it usually <laughs> is in the cave it's household you know just everybody's screaming all the time yeah uh, so i figured you know what let me get lost in the noise something about you know, being in a coffee shop full of people, which is not always the case in this particular coffee shop, you know, it's actually quite dead most of the time. But, you know, being in the coffee shop with people and having all this background noise of people walking around the shopping mall and, you know, there's little fountains around me so you can hear the water running, which sometimes makes you want to pee, but, you know, mostly you just <laughs> hear the water running. It allows me to get lost in that noise. And I don't know about you, but the other thing I love is people watching. I just love watching people, how they sort of just you know kind of walk around with their shoulders kind of slouched and their head down and really hating their life and having no purpose it really reminds me that i should be thankful for you know what i do right and uh it just inspires me to to keep pushing harder and harder because it's easy to lose motivation once you quote unquote made it man that's funny and the words that you use there in particular are funny to me the no purpose because that's one of the things that uh cupcake says attracted her to me was that i look like i have purpose when i walk because you walk around and look at these people and they they got nowhere to go nothing to do and they're not going to win at life so they're just going to slump around and move slowly <laughs> so yeah that's yeah. good to hear man so what do you have in store for us today well actually i was hoping you're gonna tell me because i'm kind of out of ideas we've done a 129 episodes dude one that's 129 things to talk about that's 129 conversations that's 129 ideas i had to come up with and and, and so now i'm like you know what you come up with an idea he's turning it around on me all right so I think that we should talk about your purpose a little bit more. Maybe we'll just we'll just go with that, Igor. I mean, what is it that drove you? Like, all right, so let me put let me frame it properly. You say that some of your best customers are the guys who are about to have a kid and have this newfound motivation. So is that how you finally figured it out how did you push through those tough three or four years where you didn't make any money well man it's it's really it's really weird because i'm i'm not like most people i'll tell you that right up front i'm very different in that regard i could visualize myself living a really bad life if i didn't change it quickly right so even though i was working I had a job at the time and I was like, I could say that I'm still young. I have my, you know, this whole life in front of me. Instead, somehow what I envisioned for myself, if I didn't change, right, was this really gray life of me. Actually, let me, let me go back and let me say this. The one thing that was really common for virtually every single guy in our community was how they, as soon as they made it, as soon as they kind of moved out of their parents' home or sometimes even before that, but as soon as they hit puberty, what they would do, they would go get a job and save money to buy a used car. 
right? So they would buy like a like a piece of shit car that was okay. I mean, for in terms of like mechanical uh, issues, right? It was it wasn't too bad, and they would start pimping it because <laughs> I mean everybody was yeah. I mean when I was growing up, we had the pimp my ride on MTV yeah. with Fifty Cent. You know what I mean? So everybody would start pimping it by putting different rims on it, you know, giving it a paint job, putting different seats on, putting you know, like a big you know stereo oh my in God. it, and so. Really, their life revolved around getting a car. Now, as soon as they got that car, you would see them walk differently. You would see their posture change. You would see their life, like, like you would see their attitude towards life get real, real, real good because they felt like they've accomplished a major milestone in their life. I was looking at that and I felt sick to my stomach. I felt really bad about these people because if that is what you aspire in life towards, I mean, you're pretty much setting yourself up for a really shitty life because nobody out of these guys was had the balls to dream about owning a Rolls Royce, right? Nobody even could dream of about you know owning a Lamborghini. Nobody. They didn't even think that was possible. In fact, they won't even like the real borderline. I would say the edge of what it, what was possible for them, and I know because I've had a bunch of these conversations uh, with with these guys. Is you know they would own a like a like a Toyota Camry or something. You know that would be like the the ultimate I made it achievement, the milestone, the checkpoint, whatever. And so looking at these guys, if I didn't change, I could foresee myself spending the rest of my life thinking about that stuff, literally just living a life where. You know, my purpose would be to buy a used car and then three years later, try to figure out how to get a cheaper car and pay off a portion of the debt until at one point I wouldn't be able to exchange it. And I would have to come up with a huge like lump sum to pay off my car. And then I would get into this whole game all over again simply because you need a car to move around. Right. Yeah. And uh, of course, if that is the level of the problems you're trying to solve in your life, I mean, it's really easy to imagine how the rest of your life looks like. Yeah, that's it's really mediocre. It's really bad. That's uh, one of the things that I like to say, which might be a little crude, and I don't know where I first heard it, but rich people have have plenty of problems every day, facing problems. Poor people have only one problem: life. And so I'd, <laughs> I'd rather have the rich people problems personally. <laughs> so let me let me dig deeper into that. Your dad was actually an employee, wasn't he? Didn't you grow up where job life seemed the only weird way to go? How did you end up moving into this entrepreneur space? Well, yeah, my dad was an employee, especially after he moved to Israel. I mean, that's all he could do. And, and he would have to settle for uh, the lowest paying jobs, like security guard without a gun in a convenience store, watching for shoplifters, which was really hum humiliating to him because, you know, he's an officer. He's like, he comes out of a, he went to an army school uh, in Moscow. Uh, so he graduated an officer. He retired from military as a major. Now, can you imagine somebody who retired from military as a major and had, you know, and, and who commanded an entire freaking unit? I mean, I'm not sure if it's a unit or like a battalion or whatever, but he had a bunch of people under his command. I'm talking like 50 to 100 people or so. He was responsible for looking after, taking care of, making sure they're fed, making sure they're like on schedule, etc. To going and, and, and doing these odd jobs like an assistant cook in a, in a hotel, right? Or, uh, you know, where, where your job is to like cut tomatoes. I mean, he went to this job one time and for the entire freaking day, he would cut tomatoes. Can you believe that? That's unbelievable. Like that, that was his job. <laughs> cut freaking tomatoes into the freaking salad. And then, you know, that, but that was an odd job. He settled for the most part for security jobs where he had to watch for shoplifters and stuff like that. And um, the, his most recent security job, like the last one before I was able to help him retire completely, you know, but basically supporting him and my mom as well. That last job was a, uh, a security guard position at the same uh, facility where I worked as a security guard. In fact, I, I never even told this story to anybody, but I used to steal hours, steal work hours from my dad because we worked at the same facility. We were like written down as two separate employees, obviously. And I would actually call him up and I say, hey, dad, can I get your weekend hours this week 
because I'm really tight on cash. Wow. Now, it doesn't mean that my dad wasn't tight on cash. He was always tight. He was always living, you know, not even paycheck to paycheck. He was always sinking deeper and deeper in debt. But everybody was hoping for me to come in and save the day at some point. And at the time, I, I started getting some traction. My business started getting, you know, making like 10 to $30 a day. So, you know, but I still needed some extra income. And I would call him up and I would say, Dad, can I, can you, can you give me your hours? And obviously, you know, him being my dad, he would say, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I would take his hours. I would literally take food out of my dad's mouth to feed my own family. The thing about that and something that I see also in my life is my dad, well, my dad wasn't educated, didn't do anything, but he always went to work, whether he liked the work or didn't like the work, to make sure that we were taken care of. So I'm kind of seeing a common thread there where your dad had to humble himself to be able to take care of you guys. And maybe he was betting on Igor being the czar of Zolo ads, but maybe he's just a good family man. So what, what has that example done for you? Well, it wasn't easy because, sure, I, I can respect him being able to step over his ego and kind of do it. But I've seen the other side of that struggle because when he would come back home, he would drink. And um, like he would always now I look back on that time and it, it, it was almost like he was pushing me to accomplish more than he was able to. But I am grateful uh, for him you know, making the decision to move the family over to Israel because as a result, I was able to become who I am today. Because if I were still in back in Ukraine, I wouldn't be able to use PayPal to receive payment. You know, something as simple as just getting paid would not be possible if I was still living in a third world country such as Ukraine. That would be really difficult. So not to mention all the other, you know, dangers and, and risks that came with it. So it, it's a duality for me. I mean, I believe he could have done a better job. And it may sound harsh, but, you know, uh, it is what it is. And I don't necessarily, you know, I don't necessarily feel that he did the best he could. He could have done much better. He could have done much better. And this is just me being real with you guys. Uh, I know I'm being critical, but that's how I am. I mean, and today we are perfectly fine. We have a great relationship. Like I said, I support my family uh, financially and it's a, it's a different time. But back then it was hard for the entire family, trust me, because at one point, about six months after we immigrated, he had to go and undergo an open heart surgery because he worked too hard in the beginning. Instead of going to a, like a Hebrew school to learn the language, he went to work immediately and my mom as well. And so to make some money because, I mean, he was always money oriented. He was never like really, really super duper successful, but he was always thinking about money. So he and my mom, they went to work at a factory that was making computer chips here in our hometown, which is now closed, by the way. It went bankrupt at some point. But he worked for six months, and then they rushed him into surgery. They saved his life, but for the next year and a half, he couldn't get a job because he was still recovering from surgery and because nobody would hire somebody who's like, I think at the time he was closing on 50 or like just over 50, and he didn't know the language or had any skills for the modern day marketplace, right? And, and I'm sure this is, by the way, very common even to this day. Um, a lot of the clients that reach out to us for traffic tell me the very similar stories. So we ended up struggling really bad and sinking deep in debt, going off of just my mom working until the point when she lost work, she got fired. Okay, she was so exhausted from working every single day for 12 hours, uh, 12 hour days that she walked into the uh, factory facility with a cigarette in her mouth. Mm. Like she literally forgot to take it out. She, I'm not sure what she was thinking, but she got fired. And from that moment, she couldn't find a job for another two years. So we were literally going hand to mouth at that time. Let's, let's go back to that. You say that your dad could have done a better job, and I'm sure a lot of us actually think that way. But I know something about you, which is you are motivated by the stick and not the carrot. So... Was that a motivator for you to do better? Yes, absolutely. For a while, it was, it kind of was reaffirming that life sucks and that I'm unlucky, but eventually it served as, as the, as the ground into which the seeds were planted. And, um, those seeds grew into the Igor, you know, today, the Igor that doesn't tolerate failure, the Igor that doesn't accept defeat, the Igor that doesn't accept poverty and that considers poverty as sinful probably as any other sin, right? Uh, like um, <laughs> poverty to me. Yeah, poverty to me is a disease. It's, it's, uh, I fear poverty. You know, I fear poverty as if it's death. And so, yeah, that's definitely a, 
a big reason why because I really during those years I really felt what it what it means to be the poor kid and what it means to have your entire class go on a field trip and you not going because you were too embarrassed and ashamed to ask your parents to give you the money which was at the time like 30 bucks or something. Now, I know they would find the money to give me, but I didn't want to put this extra burden on them because I felt I was a burden as it is, being a kid, being somebody who needs to eat and wear clothes. So I basically did not tell them and I pretended to be sick every single time that my class went out on on field trips into museums and stuff like that. So like that was just one example of of how I had to just adapt. And so when... You know, by sheer chance of an argument with a friend, I was able to get my hands on a uh, copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is the first book that really told me that to become rich, you need to act a certain way, you need to think a certain way, and you don't need to, and you don't, and you, and you don't have to buy into the idea that you have to be born rich to be rich. You know, when I got that, I was ready for it. I was ready for pretty much anything, right? That you know, for any resource that would tell me what I wanted to hear and what I couldn't allow myself to believe. And so naturally, right, I went into the space, the space I am in right now, the space of business opportunity, uh, where people just like me who struggle financially are now seeking a better way, are now seeking a way out out of a really miserable existence. And so let this be a testament to you guys listening. If you are still in that place at whichever stage in your life, if you're in that place financially and emotionally, you know, let me be your testament and an example that you could start out broke and frustrated and clueless and make it to a point in your life where, where other people seek your advice and mentorship to show them the way to financial freedom. I like it. So I want to take one more sidetrack here. You grew up a certain way. You did the work on yourself to be better. And I'm wondering how this shows up at home. How does this show up with your family? What are you doing differently so that you're not like your dad? Oh, that's a great question. Well, first off, I say no to my my daughter, right? I don't want to spoil her too much, although I think it's too late. For that, but <laughs> I do say no to my daughter, but I don't say no to my daughter as often as I as I got you know no said to me. Uh, second, I make sure that money is visibly spread around the house at all times. So if you walk into my home, you will see money, whether coins or bills, everywhere in the kitchen, oh man, um, in the living room, in the in the bathroom, in my in my bedroom, right? Everywhere you go, you'll see money because I want Erica to know that money is an abundant resource. It's not something that's scarce, which is the way I grew up. Because ever since we moved to Israel, which was seventeen years ago, right? The one thing that was made clear to me, not because my parents told me that, but because that was the environment I grew up in, that money is scarce and you have to make a decision. Like there was one month when we had to choose between buying groceries with uh, less than $100 that were, that were left in the bank account or in a visa card or something. Yeah, I think we were already living like in debt. So we were like sinking deeper in debt every single month. So the allowed debt, I think, the we're like less than one hundred dollars away from hitting the threshold for the month, and we had to choose either we pay the electric or uh, we go and we buy some food for the week. Uh, well, we chose the food, and uh, thankfully, not sure how my mom. I think she just begged and pleaded with the um, electric company to not shut us down. But you know that that's not a. Uh, I, I don't wish uh, this on anyone. You know to have to make such decisions. I don't. I don't like this idea that. In today's society, in such an abundant universe, in such an abundant uh, world, where we have so much technology and so many resources, that one has to choose between food or shelter, or food or uh, like light. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any sense. All right. So money spread around the house. Interesting. I never ever thought about that. So I think that's our time for today. And. Uh, Thank you for being candid and open and playing along here, Igor. That was fun, and I'm sure you'll hear from the list builders on what they think. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll be back next time. Thank you for listening to the List Building Lifestyle. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to never miss an episode. Because who knows, just one conversion tactic we share on the show might double your list and double your business. 
download the transcript of today's episode and all future episodes at LizBuildingLifestyleShow.com. And don't forget to claim your complimentary copy of the Wealthy List Builder Survival Guide at LizBuildingLifestyleShow.com forward slash survival. This is Igor Kafetz, and until next time we talk, have a good one. This is the podcastfactory.com.